Good morning, it's Dr. Rutledge, and we're on section three of talking about something really simple. Uh, what should we name it? Uh, it's uh, something like eat better to, to get better, but uh, it's more on another topic, which is everybody already knows pretty much what I'm going to suggest, except for maybe a few minor changes. And what I wanna talk about is the deeper meaning of something that's really obvious and really simple, but is, I think, in my experience, deadly. That is to say, it routinely derails, hurts, harms the patients that I talk with and often leads to their failure of reaching their goal of being healthier and thinner, um, either without surgery or with surgery. And so I want to talk about this one thing, which I don't think most people think about or talk about. And it's really important uh, to get success if we understand this. And it's very important for the cause of failure if you don't understand it. So I won't delay anymore, but just tell you it is the fact that most of my patients that I talk to are relatively intelligent or highly intelligent, and they understand what they should be eating what they should be doing, what kind of lifestyle they should be leading, and yet they don't. So let me say that a couple of different ways. Is in other words, someone is being crushed by a stone and they could get out, but they don't. Someone is facing uh, the edge of a cliff and they're told to move back away from the edge of the cliff, they know they should move away from the edge of the cliff, yet they don't. Most people understand very clearly that they should eat a healthy diet. And they know in general, that should be mostly kind of fresh fruits and vegetables and whole grains, unless they're kind of lost their mind and become keto. They know what they should be eating. They know that popcorn and junky foods and candy and ice cream and <clears throat> french fries and hamburgers and pizza are really not healthy. Yet, when they are honest with me, when they take time to kind of get over the initial shielding of kind of hiding what they're doing, many people, and I would say probably most of us, are failing to do what we know we should do. And I, that's such an important point. I'd like to say it three more times and people get annoyed with me. So I'm gonna say it again. You know what to do, pretty much. I have some tips and tricks, but you know what to do, but you can't do it. You know what to do, but you can't do it. You know what to do, but you can't do it. And so what we talked about in the first two presentations and what we're gonna talk about today is why. So we want to talk about the wiring inside of us that makes us unable, in many cases, to do what's best for us. And we want to talk about examples that are all over our experience in the world, not just with obesity. Obesity is only one of the major problems that's related to knowing what to do, but being unable to do it. And again, if you look at the first few minutes here, I haven't said anything. <laughs> you could just skip ahead after this, but it's so important and it's so routinely misunderstood that I'm gonna take another few minutes because when I begin to discuss this in more detail with patients, often they say, yes, yes. And then they'll often cry. Um, they'll be sad. They'll sometimes be angry and defensive. They'll say, say things, I know I can't do it. I've tried. That's why I'm having surgery. Their voice will raise, they'll often crack because they have faced this, they have seen it, but then they will often give in to some ideas. And I say these are ideas because I don't think they're fulfilled by science. That is to say, they will tell me, I can't do it, I'm weak. I can't do it because I don't have the strength. I can't do it. And they'll say a variety of emotional things, oftentimes coming back to self-criticism. And what I wanna to bring to your attention today, what we talked about in the previous two presentations is that's not right. You are not bad, you are not weak. You have been addicted by companies who wanna sell you junk food, okay? It's not your fault but our society is surrounded 
by foods that essentially poison us. And companies make billions of dollars selling us things like cigarettes. And those companies are not motivated to fix our cigarette addiction. There are companies that make billions of dollars selling us alcohol. There are companies that make billions of dollars selling us narcotics. Now those things may be far away in your mind from our talking point today, which is about food. They are not. They are exactly, precisely the same thing as we talked about. And I'll summarize our previous talks and tell you that if you take a mouse or a person and you give them narcotics, alcohol, cocaine, nicotine in cigarettes, caffeine in coffee, they will initially show a positive chemical change in the brain, an increase particular, particularly in a chemical called dopamine. Dopamine goes up in response and dopamine changes the animal. It changes the animal from someone, for example, who would run away from a shock, run away from swimming in cold water, run away from personal harm to someone who's willing to go through that. And the more that that dopamine surge is instituted through an animal study or in life, the more powerful the need for the dopamine in the absence of it, and the more powerful the drive is to get it again and to get it in higher doses. That chemical addiction, which many of us are somewhat familiar with, we may know or have someone in our family that has had drug addiction or alcohol or alcoholism or alcohol use disorder as it's now called. We may know that and we may not match it up with obesity, but in fact, they are precisely the same. When you have an animal or a person and you give them sugar, some of the research has demonstrated that that's more powerful. It's stimulating dopamine and addiction than cocaine. Fat and salt and sugar are addictive drugs. Now, <clears throat> very small amounts of caffeine, very small amounts of nicotine, very small amounts of cocaine and cocoa products can be safe. But when they are weaponized and used against us, they modify our behavior, they control us, they take us over into an addict. And that addictive state is something that most obese people are in constantly. They are essentially converted drug addicts because of the companies that sell us salty, sugary, fatty, greasy, basically poisonous foods. Okay. Well, maybe I'm just a nut. Maybe I'm just ranting against, um, you know, capitalist business, and <laughs> we should all change over, not listen to me, and vote Republican. <laughs> all right. Well, maybe. But if you're suffering from obesity, it's important that you understand the underlying mechanism because we'd like to fix it. Our goal is then to recognize that obesity is essentially access to and use of a drug called salt, sugar, or fat. That's what makes us obese, diabetic, give us heart disease, stroke, dementia. Uh, all of these problems can be traced back to this poisonous crack house that we live in. We're addicted, okay? Now, we've said that before. We went through more details on the study. That's the introduction again. Today, we're gonna talk about a way out, some tips and tricks to fight your way out. So I have to begin by saying it's not easy. In other words, if you look at curing narcotic addiction, cigarette smoking, caffeine use in coffee, um, you name it, all of them are difficult. On the other hand, we can be smarter, we can be cleverer, and we can get out. It is possible. In my own little way, I had something similar to that. And I've told that story elsewhere. But basically, what we know now is there are some tricks and traps for you to be helped in small ways to get out. So our goal today is to say, get out. We want to get you out. Let's get out. And I'm gonna use a bunch of silly analogies. I'm gonna say it's like fighting a war. I'm gonna say it's tough. I'm gonna to say like you're the new recruit coming into the, uh, to the army to go to battle. The battle is for your life. And uh, I'm gonna tell you things, but I don't take any risk and it's not difficult for me to tell you things. So you'll forgive me. 
I'm more like the fat old general who tells you what to do, but you're the one who has to go out and fight this battle. But it's a battle that can be won, but it's a, it's a battle that you need skill. If you just go to a war and you don't know how to use your gun, if you don't know how to fight, if you don't know how to participate in that kind of battle, and again, I'll apologize for me using kind of a warlike analogy, but I think it's a life and death battle in the patients that I see, and I think it's one that can be won. So my suggestion is let's think of it in a serious tone. If it's kind of a guy uh, analogy, I hope you'll forgive me and maybe skip this part, but I view it as a life and death struggle that can make a difference in whether you're sad or happy. And so it is a battle. It is, in my opinion, a life and death battle. And you need skill, knowledge, training to win. It doesn't mean you have to have all that skill and knowledge and training to start. <clears throat> what we're going to say over and over again is a really embarrassing and silly cliche, which is baby steps. In other words, do little small things to start. But our ultimate goal is we want you free of addiction. We want you eating a healthy diet and we want you satisfied that you've gotten over the addiction. So thinking of addiction in particular, most research suggests that the first month of trying to get rid of an addiction is the worst and it can be terrible. And in fact, in a similar way, it's tough in my experience with patients to get over this, to get the battle won. <clears throat> On the other hand, it's doable, but it's doable if you pick up the skills, excuse me, <clears throat> the skills that you need to fight this battle. And that's what we're going to talk about today, some tricks and traps. Now, let's talk about how the addiction works. Number one is I'm going to tell you some of my experience with patients. So a lot of my patients think they're going to be clever. They've read about the uh, <clears throat> intermittent fasting literature, so they skip breakfast. And they think that's tactically clever. They think that's a, a good strategy to help them. They'll skip that and then they'll eat some lunch and oftentimes even skip that. Then what they'll notice, they start getting really hungry around, excuse me, <clears throat> hungry around um, mid afternoon. And so then some junk food might sneak in. Then they'll have a relatively larger dinner. And then what they'll find usually around eight o'clock after the first Netflix show is over, they get the munchies and oftentimes they go out into the kitchen and whatever's in the refrigerator, freezer, or the cupboards is kind of fair game. And that's often junk food like crackers, cookies, uh, cake, ice cream, uh, potato chips, things like that. And so that is often the way people describe their battle. And then they'll often during this presentation it will be difficult for both of us because they'll often start crying because they know that what they're doing is not the correct thing. It's not what they want. They're desperately trying to change for themselves, for their family, for their husband and children. And in fact, their children are following in their footsteps as well. So that's a process of eating that we wanna talk about, that we wanna change and explain why. Why is that a bad way of eating? Why is that bad? <clears throat> well, we wanna think about breathing again. And we talked about that before. But we want to tell you that you're not in charge of yourself. We want to tell you that there are at least two of you inside of you. There's the good person, the intelligent person, the kind person, the thoughtful person, the one I'm talking to. And there's what I like to call lizard brain. <laughs> and this isn't exactly anatomically correct because the structures in the brain and the chemical pathways in the brain are more complex than I present it. But I think this is a good, simple way of describing things. So let me tell you that, in my opinion, that paradox of you wanting to eat healthy and not eating healthy is hard to explain. But I think we can explain it if I say there are two of you inside your head. There's two of you inside your head. And let me show them both to you. One is we can put a scanner on your head uh, or in a mouse's head and then we can watch now with what's called a functional MRI, the brain pathways light up. So as I'm talking to you now behind my left ear in the cortex of the brain, you can actually see little flashes of neurons lighting up as I speak. The words are formed right back here behind my uh, 
left ear. <clears throat> and as that words are formed, then signals are sent and I say those words. And that I would say right now seems to be who I am, that's me. On the other hand, there are other things going on in my body right now. Like for example, as I'm talking, I'm breathing. And I could decide to breathe a little more or I could hold my breath. And so you might say, well, that's all the same person. No, when I'm talking or walking or watching TV or anything, my breathing continues and it's run by the other person inside of us, lizard brain, I call him or her. I tend to use a, a male term for lizard brain because, well, maybe the reason is obvious. <laughs> Anyways, lizard brain does a lot of stuff for us and it turns out that that part of our brain is pretty primitive. If we go back and look at the anatomy of a brain of a brain in a lizard, it doesn't have much more than that kind of brain stem and very rudimentary brain components. It doesn't have a fully functioning cortex like we have. But it does do a lot of things exactly the way we do, or conversely, we do it exactly the way they do, which is, for example, breathe. You don't have to think at all about breathing. In other words, Right now, you could swim, you could watch TV, you could go for a run, whether you needed a little more oxygen, a little less oxygen, whether you needed to excrete some more carbon dioxide, all that would be taken care of automatically by lizard brain, meticulously monitoring your oxygen, your carbon dioxide, and you have nothing to think about. On the other hand, if you wanted to, you could hold your breath. So for example, now I could for uh, demonstration purposes, hold my breath for 10 seconds. <sighs> Anyways, I could, um, but I could not hold my breath probably for 10 minutes. And even if I had all the incentive, all the personal drive, all the personal wishes, if I were to get a million dollars, if I could get, if I could hold my breath for 10 minutes, that's not going to happen, right? We understand that lizard brain is actually more in control of us than we realize. So for example, going to the bathroom, uh, certain feelings, they come from deeper inside of us. And most importantly, they are beyond our control in many cases. So breathing is exactly like eating an appetite in that if we want to, we could turn away a pizza. If we wanted to, we could hold off breathing. But there are times when breathing and lizard brain takes over. At trying to hold your breath for 10 minutes, lizard brain says no, and we cannot win. We go up against lizard brain. In one of those situations, we routinely lose. You cannot fight lizard brain, but we can outsmart him. Our goal today is to teach you how to be smarter than your lizard brain. Because when you give in to eat, when you don't want to, when you know you shouldn't, when you get it blotted out of your memory that you shouldn't be eating cake and cookies and donuts and potato chips and other kinds of junk food crap, that's lizard brain taking over. So one of the most powerful beginning steps is to realize that is you your good wishes being taken over by lizard brain. And the very first thing I wanna point out to you, you can fight him. Now, pure mano y mano fighting in a war where you stand in front of the enemy and shoot at him and he shoots at you, if he has a bigger gun, a quicker draw, you're dead. What I will tell you is if you try to hold your breath up against lizard brain, you must always lose. When you try to stop eating bad foods by just saying, I won't eat it and doing tactically other errors, like you have a gun to fight with, but you shoot yourself in the foot, you will lose. You're losing if you're overweight. You're tactically outmatched in this war to make you better. Lizard brain says, eat and you must eat. Lizard brain says, breathe, you must breathe. But remember, you can hold your breath for 10 seconds. You can win if you know certain strategic approaches to this battle. We have to know our enemy. We have to know lizard brain, how he works. And then we have to use tactics 
to help us fight it. So if you wanted to breathe more during the day, you could take a few extra breaths as often as you wanted to. Excuse me. <clears throat> Similarly, if you wanted to hold your breath for 10 seconds, 10 or 20 times during the day or a half a minute or whatever, you could do that during the day if you did it frequently. If you said, I wanna do it all at once, it's difficult. Let's use that as strategy number one. Eat more frequently, okay? We learned this from our MGB patients. What we wanna do is we wanna quiet lizard brain's desire to eat junk food. <clears throat> when you have starved yourself for most of the day, my experience shows that you're likely to have a craving and that craving is difficult to, difficult to control. The lizard brain gets out and the lizard brain wins and then the good intellectual part of you that's trying to be healthy loses. Let's not try and hold our breath for 20 minutes. Excuse me. <clears throat> what we wanna do here is use a tactic to fight lizard brain. We wanna hold our breath for 10 seconds, multiple times during the day. So instead of skipping breakfast, never skip breakfast. In fact, what my studies show in my MGB patients eat six small meals a day, okay? Why? Because lizard brain grows in his desire to eat and his ability to overcome your good ideas, your good choices with bad choices, the longer you hold out. Now, there is a point after fasting for 48 hours and things like that where you begin to overcome lizard brain, but not during the day. And long-term fasting is a potential technique, but it's pretty powerful and it has some risks. And I'm not talking about that today. I'm talking about something that is so easy, anybody, including me, can do it. So what we're gonna suggest is frequent small meetings, <laughs> me me meals, <clears throat> sorry. If you eat six small meals a day, what we have found is you're less likely to, to get extra hunger from lizard brain. We do not wanna wake up the lizard. Leave the lizard quietly satiated. Let him feel full and he's less likely to come up and fight you. He's still down there and he's still dangerous, but one first tactical step is we're gonna use Air Force, okay? We're gonna use Air Force, we're gonna use Army, we're gonna use Navy, we're gonna use all kinds of tactics to fight lizard brain. Tactic number one, don't get hungry. When you get hungry, that is the call to wake up lizard brain. Then he comes upstairs and says, I'm taking over and you lose. Don't fight lizard brain, outsmart lizard brain. You have more intelligence than lizard brain, but he has the power. He is a more primitive animal. He drives you to do foolish, dangerous, difficult and bad things. Don't let him come up and take over the reins of your body. Don't let him take over your ability. And step number one to fight this is really simple. For goodness sake, never skip breakfast. And then what we recommend is a schedule set by your alarm on your clock that's something like this. Six, eight, 12, sorry. <laughs> eight, 10, 12, three, six, eight, okay? So at each one of those times, your phone should go off or maybe even 30 minutes beforehand. And then you should either have prepared or prepare a good healthy food. Shut down lizard brain. If you eat ahead of time, lizard brain, that is hunger, is less likely to wake up, come upstairs and wrench the controls away from your good brain, the brain that's listening to me now and take over. <clears throat> six small meals, eight, 10, 12, three, six, eight. Now, <clears throat> if you want to be really strong when you start off, eat foods <clears throat> that are not addictive, okay? The second tactic is really simple. If you wanna get off cocaine, maybe don't take so much cocaine, okay? If you wanna stop drinking, maybe don't drink so much alcohol. If you wanna stop smoking, you hear me? All right, let me say it a few more times. We're gonna have six small meals, we want a quiet lizard brain. In addition, we know that we are dealing with a lizard brain that's become addicted. 
by the dopaminergic pathway to get hungry and demand food, particularly salt, sugar, and fat. So during those six meals, do you think that you should have salty, sugary, or fatty foods? No, of course not, all right? Tactic number two, okay? This is battlefield tactics. Don't be stupid. Don't think you're cleverer than me and you can figure this out. When you look at your first morning breakfast, what should it be? It shouldn't be salty. It shouldn't be sugary. It shouldn't be fatty, okay? Healthy foods. Go look at my American Heart Association uh, video to see what are healthy foods. But we're going to come back and talk about why the healthy food, the number one healthy food in this battle, should start off every day with steel cut oats, or if you want to get radical, wheat berries. I know, I know, I'm crazy. I apologize. Look it up. Why we're going to talk about later, but it has to do with GLP-1, PYY, and amylin and other things. But for right now, what we want to do is have breakfast, our snack, lunch, afternoon snack, dinner, and late night snacks, all to be small and healthy. No, we don't want keto. No, don't say the word carbs. We're not talking about that. That's all stupid and we're not going to talk about that now. Those are confused people who have no idea what they're talking about. We're leaving that out of our discussion today. That's for another day. Healthy foods, guess what? Mostly fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds, okay? So we'll come back and talk about this, but six meals a day and number two, tactic number two, not poisonous addictive foods, okay? So that's salty, sugary, fatty foods. Also, no artificially uh, created foods. So no artificial sugars or sweets or anything like that. They count as sweets. They are as addictive or more addictive than actual sugar. Okay, now we've got two tactics. And what I'm gonna suggest is gonna be difficult at the start, so you don't have to do this, but this is the aspirational goal. Tactic number three is that that meal should be made in a couple of minutes in a microwave in a coffee cup. Tactic number three is the meal should be made relatively quickly and easily so that you don't have time to wake up lizard brain. When he sees you're going to the kitchen, he says chocolate, candy, uh, a hot dog, uh, pepperoni. <laughs> Anyways, what we wanna do is tactic number three is you want a short, simple, healthy choice. We already said healthy food, but the next tactic is we wanna be in and done in just a few moments, okay? So we're thinking of a microwave, a coffee cup, and eating about a half a coffee cup to a coffee cup to get started. That's gonna seem like a small meal, but some of our patients weren't eating anything. Some of our patients were eating things like cereals and things like that that actually make things worse. There's a long discussion about that. And so what we're saying here now is look, we want a quick, easy meal. We want it easy and we want it before lizard brain even knows you're up and fighting. We want a, a commando attack at their front point, their machine gun nest up ahead of us. We go in fast and hard. We wanna get in there and quiet lizard brain before he can wake up and take over and hijack the desire to eat unhealthy food, to eat healthy foods and force you to eat unhealthy foods. So we want a quick first meal. Okay, the foundational principle of the crazy Rutledge diet, the MGB diet, the let's get better diet is steel cut oatmeal, or if you want to be very radical, they're called wheat berries, which are totally unprocessed but hulled wheat seeds. And they're really tasty, but we won't talk anymore about that. Just do steel cut oats when you start, and we'll talk about the other later. Steel cut oats are a miraculously good choice to fight lizard brain. And we're gonna talk about its other techniques that it works, but first thing in the morning, you can have steel cut oats made in three to five minutes. Now, there are crazy people who say, I start cooking my steel cut oats the night before and uh, I then have to boil them. And no, 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 no. Steel cut oats, three to five minutes in a coffee cup, put about a quarter of a cup of steel cut oats in the bottom, 
put about a half a cup of water in and microwave it depending on the power of your microwave from three to five minutes and you've got breakfast. I didn't say it would be like a donut. <laughs> And I just start, stop being angry and fussing at me and turning off the video. This is just a beginning, for goodness sake. I know it sounds hard. It's not that hard. Again, do you want to be diabetic? Do you want to be overweight? Do you want to fight this? All I'm saying is have a bowl, a cup of oatmeal. You know, people will hang up on me when I say this. I say, you called me. You're crying. You're diabetic, you're overweight, people treat you badly, you feel badly about yourself. And all I'm asking is to eat a cup of oatmeal to start and people say, I can't do it. <laughs> Come on, you eat a half a cup of oatmeal. And then they say, well, can I put cinnamon and uh, sugar and uh, uh, all kinds of things on it? And I say, well, no. So to start off, I try to be very rigid but uh, you can do more than that. But we're gonna say, many people come to me, as I say, devastated, crying on the phone, brilliant people, physicians, all kinds of people, they wanna get better. And I say eating oatmeal and they say no. And so I use an analogy. I say, when people call me and they're sick, they're angry, they're frightened, they're upset, they're crying, they're devastated, their sleeve has failed them or their MGB has had weight regain or they have reflux. They're telling me how sad their life is, how awful it is. They, they want another surgery or this or that. And I say, okay, let's start off with a bowl of oatmeal. I say, oh, I can't do that. <laughs> $17,000 for a new surgery, $6,000 for a new surgery, um, <laughs> $10,000 for a new drug. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no. Half a cup of oatmeal. Oh, I can't do that. So I use this analogy, you're far out from the shore, you're swimming in the ocean or a deep cold lake, you can barely see where the shore is anymore and you're swimming in the wrong direction, okay? I see in the distance or maybe you see it too, a shark fin and then two, they're heading in your direction. And I come up in a boat and I say, come get in and you look at me paddling in the water for a little bit, you say, oh, that's a blue boat. I was hoping for a red boat. <laughs> Your life is at risk. Your health and well-being, stop fussing about a cup of oatmeal. So I won't say any more about it. You can stop here. I have had people stop here. They go, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't eat that way. So anyways, but we're going to keep going. And so during the rest of the day, roughly, during six times a day, what we'd like you to do is have a meal that's roughly the size of a half or a quarter or a full cup. And by eating that much, particularly our MGB patients, you should be satiated. You should be full and your desire to eat junk food should gradually go down over a period of about a month. We expect that you're going to fail, that many times that instead of eating those healthy foods, you'll choose to have one of your bad foods. So we have a couple of tips for that. One is be kind to yourself. Be forgiving of yourself. Let yourself go. Don't be harsh or demanding. What we say is fall down six times, get up seven. So if you fail, don't be critical. Don't worry. Dust yourself off. Get back up and come back in fighting. If you have to go have pizza or cake or an alcoholic drink or whatever some evening, be compassionate to yourself. Love yourself, take care of yourself, be good to yourself, fall down. Remember that you're going to start again tomorrow. It's not the end of the game. The drug addiction wants you to give up. We're tough fighters. I'm teaching my patients to be tough fighters. We want you to fight. Get up and fight. Get up and fight. Gosh darn it, get up and fight. Sorry. At this point, a lot of times I'm crying and the patient's crying. We want you to get better. Get better. Get up. And we know to fight a war, you don't win in one battle. And this is not play anymore. You're going to be hurt. You're going to cry. It's going to be awful. But you're going to win if you have enough strength to go forward. So the next tactic is to be forgiving. All right. 
Besides that, the next tactic is to pull the rip cord if you're in trouble, okay? The rip cord is A-O-B. In other words, sometimes you gotta go to a party or something like that, or you've just decided the heck with it, I'm gonna have a pizza or I'm gonna have potato chips tonight or whatever. Any one of those, if you still have some control over yourself and you know you're gonna give in, be compassionate as we said, but pull this rip cord if you can. If you can't, if you can't do it, we understand. But our goal is pull this emergency rip cord called AOB. What it means is you're gonna have pizza, you're gonna have cake, whatever, but in your purse, with you at all times, in your household, every day, always, you should always have some apples, oranges, and bananas, always, every day, always. And if you're going to have pizza, you're going to have pot roast or McDonald's or some crap, pull the ripcord and say to yourself, AOB, before I do this, I know I'm going to do it. I can't hold back. I want to have it. Just say to yourself, only one bite of an apple first. Only one slice of an orange first. Only one half of a banana first. Just take that bite to get started. Just get that bite to say the pact between you and the health that you wish is not broken. It's dented. It's been hurt. We're taking fire, but we're not down. We're not out yet. It's not over. I'm coming back. And gosh darn son of a gun, I'm going to take a bite of an apple, maybe even a half of an apple or a whole apple, whatever it is, whatever you can do. That's the sign that you're not done. That's the sign you're not giving up. That's the sign that you're a fighter. And then tears or whatever, have pizza, have potato chips or whatever, but forgive yourself. And just remember you pulled a rip cord and you're starting again tomorrow. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I get emotional. <laughs> Okay, now, besides oatmeal, we're going to give you about six other things, depending on how much time we want to go on this recording. We're going to six other things that you can choose during those meals. These are all relatively healthy, healthy choices. They're really simple. And this should be the foundation of your first month. Okay, so what we're going to say is we've already said steel cut oatmeal or wheat berries. Don't laugh. Wheat berries. Look it up. And you can have in your oatmeal nothing. Well, maybe something. So you make the oatmeal with water. Is there anything you can think of that we could put on that oatmeal to make it a little more palatable? No, not sugar. No, not brown sugar. No, not honey, for gosh sakes. <laughs> no, not artificial sweeteners. <laughs> not milk. Not oatmeal. No, 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 no. How about blueberries? Strawberries, raspberries. So fruit becomes our second choice. Not second bad, but second possible choice of the good foods we can eat. So when you have your steel cut oats and you're looking at that and thinking of me and bad, bad words come to your mind, calm down. <laughs> Don't send me a nasty letter. Or you can, I can take it. But what you could do is you could have blueberries. Now, blueberries have a million good things. They have polyphenols, that blue color. It's an anti-inflammatory. We don't have time to talk about all that. But you can make that steel-cut oatmeal more palatable for without harming your diet of eating healthy food by adding fruit. So you could cut up peaches. You can cut up apples. You can mix in apples. And later, we're going to talk about dried fruit. So you could throw in some uh, raisins. But all that is OK. No, you might say they're carbs, quit listening because you're not smart enough to listen to the rest of this. Stop thinking about carbs. There's another lecture on carbs, That's this is not it. Fruit is good. The sugar that's in fruit is good for you, doesn't rise your sugar, it helps protect against diabetes, it helps with weight loss. So the keto people are not wrong. So anyways, anyway, but the bottom line is you can eat fruit. And in fact, now we have the second choice for food during your day, and your days and your month of trying to get free of your drug addiction, okay? So <clears throat> all during the day, we would like you to have a bite or a piece of fruit or a slice of fruit at every one of those six meals, usually to start the meal. The research shows if you give somebody a slice of an apple before the meal, they eat less and they lose weight in controlled prospective randomized trials. That's what we wanna do. We want you to be healthier. So. During the day, you should have a bite of fruit 
for the six meals a day, seven days a week. So that means roughly you have to have around 42 pieces of fruit in your house per week. Does your shopping cart start to look different? Do your cupboards and your refrigerator start to look different? Okay, so fruit of any kind, <clears throat> all legal, all fresh, all healthy, and fruit good. So now we have two things on the list, right? So next we're gonna say, what else could you eat? Well, you can have, guess it, guess what? Fresh vegetables. So cut up carrots, cucumber, celery, uh, fresh broccoli cut up, um, radishes, green onions, um, anything you like, all kinds of fresh vegetables, all fine, all good. And again, half a cup and uh, that works well. Now, what can you put on that? Basically, you can't use salt. You can use almost any spice, extra virgin olive oil, and then all kinds of vinegar. So I would get uh, four or five different tastes of vinegar. I get red vinegar, red wine vinegar. I get rice vinegar. I would get uh, apple cider vinegar. Uh, I would get balsamic vinegar. <clears throat> and all of these can be used to spice up your vegetables. But Remember, half a cup, quarter cup, something like that, along with a bite of fruit. And now we've got on our list the steel cut oats, wheat berries, uh, fruit, and vegetables. Okay. The next one is cooked vegetables. And the way we think about this is most people for lunch or dinner will cook, say, a side of Brussels sprouts, uh, green beans, um, spinach, things like that. And we'd like you to double or triple the amount that you make for dinner and put the rest in the refrigerator. So for the next day, you can have some cooked vegetables for the next day. And you can either microwave it or eat it cold, depending on your preferences. And again, think of how quickly that meal can be made. It's the three to five minute rule. We want you to be able to eat before lizard brain wakes up and realizes you're doing it. We want this automatic, we want it built in. Every time your phone goes off, you go in and you get one of these healthy things. In three to five minutes, we want you eating before lizard brain can start thinking. What we want you to do is be eating what? Steel cut oats, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, or cooked vegetables, okay? The next thing is an obvious extension, and that's basically we would like you to make on Sunday night a bunch of things on the four burner stove. We're gonna have all four burners going on Sunday night so that food is always ready. So we can meet that tactical need of being able to get you eating in three to five minutes before lizard brain can take over. We wanna come in with an early strike force and get out. And the way to do that is Sunday night, we're gonna make some food. So number one on the foods we're gonna make is gonna be vegetable soup. Now, no, you can't buy it. No, don't say bone broth, for goodness sake. That's another, thing. stop that. Um, what we want to do is make vegetable soup. If you Google it, there's like 10 million recipes, all right? You can make any kind of vegetable soup you want as long as it meets three criteria. Three criteria, okay? Number one, water. I'm clever. Um, vegetables or vegetable soup and spices, not salt, okay? Any kind of vegetable soup, whatever you want, however you want, all kinds of things, mushrooms, garlic, anything you want, no salt, <clears throat> and just vegetables, water, and spices. Turmeric, garlic, um, cayenne pepper, anything you want. And that brings us then to the next thing to be on the burner for Sunday night, and that's make a pot of beans. Now, there could be any kind of beans, it can be chickpeas, black beans, pinto beans, any kind of beans but we want you to make a pot of beans and that'll be in the refrigerator. And of course, when you're having your soup, if you wanna add some beans to it, uh, that'll be fine. Remember, you could take a scoop out of the beans in the back of the refrigerator, throw it in the vegetable soup to taste. Uh, you could add other spices at that time if you want. So uh, extra virgin olive oil, vinegar, and spices are all tasty treats and some beans. And then you microwave it three to five minutes later, you're eating before lizard brain can get awake. Okay, <clears throat> next, we want portable food. So dried fruits are good. Basically, most of them are coated with sugar. So that means no 
cranberries. A lot of people think cranberries are good. They're horrible because they're mostly sugar. And there's a little bit of cranberry in there, but that's a long way away from all the sugar. So what we think of the non sugar coated or sulfur dioxide uh, <laughs> dried fruits, what we recommend is either dried or regular raisins, dates without sugar with the pits or prunes. And uh, any one of those in a Ziploc baggie can take you to work or anywhere you go. Now, it turns out fruit can go to work and fresh vegetables can go to work and even cooked vegetables in a Tupperware can go to work with you. So all this is relatively portable, but dried fruits are another good choice. And now that we have raisins, we can add raisins to our steel cut oatmeal to make it a little bit more palatable as well. You're welcome. Next are nuts. No, not just me. <laughs> I know, I'm trying to make a little bit of, you know, make it lighter. Okay, anyways, um, nuts not salted. So any kind of nuts not salted, not salted, no, not salted. So any kind of nuts, that includes peanuts, which kind of have a bad reputation, but peanuts, walnuts in particular are good, almonds are good, cashews are good. Um, and that also lets us sneak in seeds like sunflower seeds and pumpkin seeds or papitas and things like that, but not salted. I know, I, 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 I like them salted. I know, no, not salted, but I, I like them. No, not salted, but uh, okay, not salted, all right? So now let's look at it. We've got steel cut oats, we've got fresh fruits, we've got fresh vegetables, we've got cooked vegetables, we've got vegetable soup, we've got beans, and we've got dried fruit, nuts, and seeds. That's all mobile, okay? Now we're gonna make pasta and then tacos, and that'll be it for the coming uh, month, including one more food that has kind of a bad reputation amongst some crazy dieters, but that's potatoes. It turns out that a boiled potato is good, French fried potato is bad, a baked potato is too hot because it creates advanced glycation end products, but boiled potatoes are particularly good with the skin on, and cut out the eyes if they're there, and uh, it turns out they're highly satiating. What that means is they make you feel full. So a small amount of potatoes are good. We recommend on that stove fourth burner on Sunday night, you make anywhere from five to 10 potatoes. And particularly we like uh, sweet potatoes along with the other colored potatoes. So blue, purple, uh, red potatoes, things like that. Those colors are actually what are called my, um, polyphenols and they're good for you. So we'd like to make 10 of those and put them in the refrigerator before you eat them, not baking them but boil them because when you boil them and put them in the refrigerator, that develops what we call resistant starch. Write it down and look it up. Basically, it makes fewer calories coming out of the potato and feeds the gut microbiome, which we'll be talking about later in one of the next videos. Okay, so now we've got potatoes. Let's make the pasta. First of all, pasta is bad. It's basically a highly processed wheat where there's no fiber. So we don't like that. So what we wanna do then is we'd like to go ahead and get the whole grain pasta. So we're gonna use four tricks. And number one is instead of the, um, the kind of straw yellow colored normal pasta, we'd like to get the darker tan colored whole grain pasta. So you wanna find pasta in there. And then number two is we'd like to have the pasta be big thick noodles instead of the thinner, finer, skinnier noodles because the research shows that you'll absorb fewer calories and you'll deliver more calories to the colon and the microbiome. And trick number three is we would like you to cook the pasta al dente because when you cook it al dente, again, you digest fewer of the calories, more of it goes down to the microbiome and that makes you healthier. And then trick number four is cook it on the other burner on Sunday night and that burner then uh, provides pasta for later in the week. And also because you cooled it, you develop what's called resistant starch again. And that's good for the same reasons. You get fewer calories and you deliver more of the calories down to the microbiome. And that makes you healthier and helps with weight loss as well. Now we're going to need pasta sauce. And no, we don't want you to buy it. We want you to make it. We want you to make pasta sauce by using the tomatoes. And I've talked to very famous chefs who said, you know, you wash the tomatoes, peel them, and simmer them. No, 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 no. We want you to make pasta sauce by keeping the skin because that has fiber. We need the fiber. We want the fiber. The fiber is good for your health and weight loss. And so it also helps you fight the 
lizard brain. So keep the skin on and instead just wash all the ingredients, whatever you want, the ingredients, vegetables, mushrooms, all kinds of things like that, garlic, cut up vegetables, put them in a blender, count to 10 and put them in the refrigerator. And then when you wanna have pasta, you've got pre-made pasta, you've got pasta sauce in the refrigerator, take out a cup full of the pasta or half a cup, take out a half a cup of the pasta sauce and microwave it for three to five minutes, you've got dinner. No pots, no pans, nothing. Okay? And then we're gonna do tacos the same way. We're gonna get a whole grain taco, not the French fried corn ta taco shell. We're gonna get a tortilla that's a whole grain taco shell or a tortilla. And then we're gonna not put ground up beef in it. We're gonna put some of our beans uh, cut up vegetables, shredded lettuce, and then we can include in that some pasta sauce. Oh no, why don't we make it taco sauce? Add some extra spices, we've got taco sauce. And that's your meal plan for the first month. I'll go ahead and stop there and that's our battle plan. And I hope you've enjoyed that. There's more to come and don't hesitate to watch the early two videos as well. So thank you all very much. Have a great day and I hope you found this useful.